Dr. Mandernack is the Executive Director of the Center for Innovation and Research on Teaching at Grand Canyon University. Her research focuses on enhancing student learning experiences in the online classroom through innovative instructional and assessment strategies. She explores strategies for integrating efficient online instruction in a matter that maximizes student learning, satisfaction, and engagement. And she has interest in innovative faculty development, evaluation model, teaching and learning analytics, and emergent instructional technology. She's an active researcher, author, presenter, and consultant in the field of online education. Welcome, um, Dr. Madrenak. Great. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you everyone for joining today. Stacy shared with me that it is a beautiful day in North Dakota, so I appreciate your willingness to stay in your office a little more while we explore how to really tap into our Gen Z students and engage them and inspire them and bring them into the learning experience. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera while I talk to save bandwidth, but I'll bring it back on at the end and we can have a little bit of a Q&A session. To start things, I actually have a question for you. When you think about teaching today, what is your greatest challenge with teaching Gen Z students? I'll just take a moment and we can share that in the chat. What is your greatest challenge with teaching Gen Z students? Stacy said just keeping their attention. If we go with what the research is currently telling us, students today are reporting a lower level of engagement than they've reported in years past. And that's kind of backed up when we look at what Margaret and Angela said, you know, getting them come to a class, getting them to have authentic engagement, getting them to think, to participate, and not only come to class, but come to class prepared prepared to learn, prepared to talk, prepared to engage in the kind of activities that will make it a value-added learning experience. Now, when we talk about Gen Z students, we're really talking about everybody born from approximately 2001 to 2010. So 2018 saw the first wave come in, and the last five years, our traditional age students have really been in this Gen Z category. And what research told us is, even prior to the pandemic, this generation was different. This generation was born with a device in their hand. From the time they were toddlers, they could navigate an iPhone, they had an iPad. They are so used to technology that they don't even really see it as an additional experience or as an add-on. It is an all technology, all the time kind of generation. And because of that, they have been much more visual, they're much more interactive, they tend to be really independent learners, and what they're seeking in their experience is a real personalized value-added education. The Gen Z student more than ever before is socially conscious. They are worried about their environment, they are worried about the social world in which they live in, and they really are focusing their education on what it personally means for them and their career and their future. So when we start thinking about what this means for our classroom and how this impacts their learning experience, it really starts to paint a different picture. More than ever before, they're coming into our classroom wanting to know why. Why do they need this class? Why do they need to learn this content? Why do they need to do that activity? Why are we teaching the way we're teaching? They are a visual generation. They want to see it. They want to touch it. They want to engage with it. You'll often hear people refer to this generation as the gamer generation. And this doesn't necessarily mean that they want to play games per se, but rather they learn with that kind of gamer mentality. I'll take you back to a game that's one more from my generation, and you can possibly relate to it. But think about the old video games like Super Mario Brothers, Donkey Kong, Pac-Man. When we were introduced to those games, we did not sit down and read the manual to figure out where we're supposed to go and what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to play the game. We just grabbed the controller and we jumped right in. And you'd start playing the game and your little Mario character would be running down the street and then you might get hit with a mushroom and you would die and you would start over. And what happened was every time you experienced something, a new pipe, a new mushroom, a floating flower, whatever it might be, you learned something from it. 
and you would die and you would start over. And each time you would get a little further down the game and you would start to understand what things were dangerous, what things were valuable, what things you wanted to jump and touch, what things you wanted to avoid. But you learned all of those things via experience. You didn't read how to play the game and look at the manual to see what was good and what was bad. You just dove right in. And that gamer mentality is what really kind of captures today's learners. They want to do things. They want to dive in. They want to debate. They want to talk. When we talk to faculty, one of the greatest challenges today is they tell us, my students aren't coming to class or they're not coming to class prepared to learn. And what that statement tells us is that we really kind of have a disconnect between the way we as faculty members are approaching the teaching and learning experience and the way our students are approaching it. We want our students to read the textbook, to come into class with some background knowledge, and we want them to be prepared, to have read the manual so that they can engage in a meaningful way. Students are coming into class saying, give me a reason to care about this content. I haven't read it yet because I don't know if I want to read it. I don't know how it's valuable to me. I don't know why it's important to me. So I'll come to class completely unprepared, ready to be engaged. They want us to let them dive in, to let them problem solve, and to start to work backwards to figure out that information, to find out what theory they need to understand, what content they need to know. They really embrace that Let's talk about it. Let's dive in. Let's experiment. Let's see what we need to know to be able to figure out this problem. And when we start thinking about how they're approaching that learning experience, they're not coming to us wanting us to spoon feed them content. They are very self reliant. They know that at a touch of a button, they can go find any piece of information that they need. They know that the internet has all kinds of content and resources for them. What they don't know is why they need to know that information. They don't know why they should care. They don't know how this is going to impact their career and their future. They don't know how this knowledge and skills is going to be valuable to them. And so when we think about this, it really puts out kind of a problem for us as teachers. There is a fundamental disconnect between how Gen Z is approaching the concept of education and how we as teachers are bringing that education to them. Now, the good news in all of this is students today absolutely believe that a college education is valuable. Almost 90% of them say, yes, this is important. College education is the pathway to a good job. So it's not that they're coming into our class believing that they don't need this. They absolutely fundamentally value education and they value the possibilities. Almost half of them are even coming to college with some college classes already under their belt. So early on, they have really embraced that they want to engage in a college experience. They want to be challenged. They want to learn more. And they see that as the pathway to their future. But they also told us, I'm not really interested in just listening to you give me content. They don't want to just absorb information so that they can spit it back out on a test or spit it back out in a term paper. They want to know why. They want to be engaged. They want to be collaborators in that process. And so when we say that our students aren't giving us their attention and they aren't engaged, perhaps the problem is we aren't creating a learning experience that allows them to truly see the value added experience for them and their education and their future career. Now this has been true for the last several years. And what the research is clearly showing us is that faculty are reporting increasing dissatisfaction with student engagement. Again and again and again, the research says, faculty are saying, my students aren't engaged. They are not participating. They are not coming to class. They are not doing the things I asked them to do. And then when we talk to students, they say, I don't see why. 
I don't see the purpose behind the way that they're doing class, behind asking me to read a textbook and then come and listen to them give me a lecture. The reality of the world that students live in is they now can find and generate information at the touch of a button. AI allows them to ask almost every discussion question we've ever asked them. It allows them to produce almost any assignment we've ever asked them to produce. And this is not only their reality today, this is their future. And so our students are looking at us and saying, show me why this is important. Show me what it means to truly have an education when it's not about getting content and then showing that you have that content available to you. So before we even dive in about Gen Z students today, we have to stop and think and ask ourselves some fundamental questions. What does it mean in our modern era to teach? And what does it look like if our students are really learning? So many of the things that we do today in higher education are really kind of based on historical ideas about teaching and learning. Long, long ago, way before we had printing presses and way, way, way before we had the internet, teaching really did involve us giving them content. Books weren't readily available. The internet wasn't readily available. And if students were going to understand theories, concepts, facts, they needed somebody to tell them about them. That's where the lecture was born. And if we go back to the early you know, lectures and philosophical times, education was only available to a very small number of people. So really learning was gauged via the interaction. They would have discussions and they would talk about it and they would dive deeper in and they would deal with problems. That's where that whole phrase, the Socratic method comes from. The idea that learning was really about dialogue and interaction. But then time went on and books became readily available and our class sizes grew and no longer could we gauge whether a student was learning by our ability to talk to them and see if they really understand it at a deep level. And they really didn't need us to be lecturing anymore. In fact, I'm going to share with you a study that we did several years ago. And this was actually done with trainees at the Nebraska State Patrol. And the Nebraska State Patrol was looking at whether or not they could change the way they taught um, trainees and move them from a lecture class where they were giving them the information in a very traditional lecture format. And they said, could we move it online? You know, it's really expensive to bring all these trainees into one training center. If we could do it online, it would be a lot more effective. But recognizing these were state patrol trainees, they said, we have to know that they learn the information. If they don't learn the information, it could be life or death for them. I mean, this is high stakes teaching and learning. And so we designed a research study in which we simply compared and we said, how well do they learn if they listen to us, give them a lecture compared to if they watch a videotape of that lecture compared to an interactive computer program. And then the final control condition was just read the textbook. And we brought all these trainees in and we assigned them to one room and whatever condition they were in, they had two hours and they either listened to a live lecture, they listened to a videotape lecture, they engaged with an interactive computer program, or they simply sat there and read the textbook. And then when they were done, we gave them a test to see how much did they learn. And what we found was they learned the most if they would simply read. The least effective way of learning was actually listening to the live lecture. Now, right after we did this study, we realized we had a problem. If we were going to do this in the real world, our students were not a captive audience. Our students would be at home. And so the level of learning depended on their willingness to engage with the content. So we replicated the study. We obviously had to get rid of the live lecture condition. So they were in their own homes and they either listened to a videotape lecture or they read the textbook or they engaged in an interactive computer program. And what we found is in that case, reading dropped off and it was the least effective. And we went to our students and we said, what, what is going on? We know that it's effective to read. And they said, yeah, but I, I don't want to read. I don't like to read. 
It wasn't meaningful for them to read, so they didn't do it. Now, circling this whole story back to what does it mean to teach and what does it mean to learn? It's not simply what we're doing, nor is it exactly what they're doing. It's the motivations behind why they're engaging the way that they're engaging. And so when we start thinking about this holistically, the lack of student engagement really is primarily a faculty problem. It's our responsibility to create learning experiences that allow students to dive in. If we're going to continue to give traditional lectures, even lectures where we pepper it in here and there with questions or we have an occasional activity, students are going to tune out because they can get the content in other ways. They're not interested in being passive recipients of information. And so we really need to start rethinking our role as faculty members. Now, this is not to say that we should not ever lecture. There are absolutely times that students need us to explain things and they want us to demonstrate and talk about it, walk them through it. But we have to think really clearly about when are those times? Our role as faculty, more than teaching per se, is really about designing engaging learning experiences. Historically in higher education, we have held firm to an instructional paradigm. And in an instructional paradigm, we really design our classes around what do I need to do as a teacher? So we focus on content coverage. We focus on what am I going to assess them with? We're going to focus on how do I design the lecture? What is going to be in my lecture slides? It's all about what I do as the teacher. But when we start to shift our perspective and really focus on designing engaging learning experiences, we shift the question and we say, how would students best learn this information? And when we start to shift that perspective, we start asking things like, what would it look like if they really learned it? What would they do? Would it be a test? Is memorization really part of what it would mean to learn this content? Is it even a paper? What would learning really look like? And then we start from that end point of what does it really look like if students learn? And we start going backwards and we say, well, how would they find the content that they need? How would they discover that information? What kind of an activity could I give them that they could then dive in and be forced to problem solve, to engage with the content? Rather than me giving them the information via a lecture, how do I design an activity that requires them to go and find it and to ask the questions? When we start to bring students in as an active part of that teaching and learning dynamic, it shifts from us giving them content and assessing whether they receive that content to them really engaging in a meaningful fashion. What they want today is they want to do something. They want to explore. They want to talk. They want to interact. <clears throat> students today, especially the Gen Z students, really do live in this interactive social world. It's not just the person sitting next to them. It's also the people on the internet and it's the person on their phone and it's the texting and it's the apps. They want to dive in. Just the other day, my daughter, who is a senior in high school, so definitely right in the middle of this Gen Z generation, was heading downstairs to do some of her homework. And before she headed downstairs, I said, you need to take care of your laundry. And she said, yeah, 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 I'll take care of it. And she takes off. Well, a few minutes later, I noticed that she has not taken care of her laundry. And so I grab that laundry basket and I angrily go flying downstairs and I can see in her bedroom that she is laying on her bed. She's got her phone in one hand. She's got her laptop propped up on her lap. She's got her TV going in front of her. I mean, just picture it, stereotypical Gen Z student. And I go flying into that room and I flick that laundry basket down and I say, you were supposed to put away your laundry. And she turns and looks at me and she said, we're working on calculus. And she turns the laptop to me and on the laptop, they have open an app where they're all interacting on it. It was actually um, 
it wasn't Zoom, it was a Google Meets. They had a Google Meets going on. On her phone, she had this demonstration video and she was holding the phone up. And then they were screencasting and using her television as a third screen. And there were four students on there talking, looking at the app, watching the video, working together to try to figure out this calculus problem. The technology was simply a seamless means to an end. And the way they pictured learning was let's do it together. Let's dive in. Let's go find our resources. Let's look at an example. Let's go back and find what we need to be able to figure this problem out. Students today are not wanting to just have us give them the information. They want us to create the challenge that shows them why they need to know the information. The number one thing you can do if you really want to engage Gen Z students is start to flip around how you approach your classes. Rather than thinking about what you need to cover and what the learning objectives are, ask yourself, why would students need to know this information? Why do they even have to take that class? Why is that class in your program of study or why is it a general studies class? And within that, why do you have the learning objectives that you have? When we can start to have students see the personal value of information, they will start to become engaged. I'll give you an example of that from my own general studies class. I teach general psychology. Students are typical, you know, 18, 19 year olds, usually in the first two years of college. Most of them are not psychology majors. They're just taking it to fill their general studies requirement. So they're not overly invested in the topic and they're not overly invested in the class. Well, even within that kind of realm, one of the chapters that we teach is neuropsychology. And students have historically hated that topic. It's all about brain function and neural communication. And they have repeatedly said they do not understand why they have to know it. They don't see the value. They don't see the relevance. They don't see the purpose. And it was consistently for about 10 years, the thing that my students complained about the most. They hated it. And so they were absolutely not engaged. And when I look back at how I used to teach it, I taught it in a very traditional fashion. Now I tried to make it engaging, but really all I was doing was trying to make it fun. And there's a difference. The old way that I would teach it, I would actually go over with them. Here's the main parts of the brain and here's what they do. And then I would have them put on shower caps and they would take Sharpies and they would kind of map out the brain on each other's shower cap heads. And I thought that I was doing active engagement. It didn't make a difference. They were still bored. They barely participated. They did not care. Well, then I reframed the whole experience. And rather than saying, you know, here's our learning objective, we're going to learn about the structure and function of the brain. I walked into class and I said, I have a really important question to ask you today. Why is drunk driving illegal? And the students would start, you know, and be like, well, because you're not thinking properly. Well, what does it mean to not think properly? What part of the brain? How is alcohol impacting that? And I would start asking them questions. And of course, they would start doing the, well, I don't know for sure. And I'd say, well, you've got your phones available. You've got it right there. Grab your phone. Start Googling. Look, what does alcohol do to the brain? How does it impact the brain? What part does it impact? How does it impact neural communication? And we start to dive in. And students start looking, and then they start asking questions, saying, well, I don't understand what this means. What does this part do? Well, if you impact this part, does it impact this part? And they started to get into it. And then they would say, well, how does marijuana impact the brain? Is it the same? Is it different? What about vapes? We flipped the dialogue. It wasn't about the content I needed to cover, although we were working on that. It was about why they should care. And I said, why should you care? Even if you don't drink, even if you don't vape and you do not smoke marijuana, people around you might. You're going to be on the highway. You're going to be sharing it with them. You're going to be in social situations where people might be drinking and then leaving. This is important to your life to understand what is going on and how it works. 
That led to the most engaging, dynamic discussion with everybody involved, phones out, looking things up, turning to their neighbors, asking questions. And then I said, well, let's think about now like where these things are. We've been talking about all these parts. And then we pulled out the shower cap, did the exact same shower cap activity, and it was an overwhelming success. The detail, the level of nuance, them trying to draw things in. What made it engaging was not the shower cap activity. What made it engaging was letting them, the active participants in the process, understanding the why and diving into the topic in a way that was personally relevant and meaningful. Now that is something our students can't just naturally get from generative AI or from the internet. They need us as content experts to show them why it's important, why they have to learn it, how it impacts their life, how the skills that they're gaining are going to help them in their future. Research finds that the Gen Z students overwhelmingly learn by doing. They want to engage. In fact, only about 12% learn well by listening. So the idea that our traditional lecture was going to engage them in any capacity is pretty much a myth. We need to flip what we think of as teaching and start really thinking of it as either a learning experience or as an interactive lecture. In an interactive lecture, we are still going to provide some content. And I would even argue that when I was doing the activity with why is drunk driving illegal, it was more of an interactive lecture. I had slides prepared. I just didn't start with my slides. We started with the question. And then as they started to dive in and investigate, and they'd say, well, I don't understand this, or what is this word, or I don't know how to pronounce this, I would start and I would pull up the slides. And I would say, well, let's take a look. Here's where it's at. Here's what this means. Now go look at this. And so I am giving them information. But the students are really kind of driving it. And I want them to talk. And I want them to use the phone. And I'm regularly asking them to do something. And so rather than me giving them information and then saying, okay, now do something with it, we start and say, let's do something. And then let's start working backwards to get the information that you need. So in an interactive lecture, you might give them some sort of a content presentation. Maybe it's a debate or a simulation or a case study, might even be a current event that you're going to pull up. And then you're going to ask them to make it personally meaningful. That reflection piece is where you talk about how this impacts their lives, how this could impact their future career, how it relates to things they already know. And there's a lot of different reflection activities that you can do. You can have students just stop, think for a little bit. You can have them journal. You can have them do one minute papers, but you want them to really start to connect it to something that is meaningful in their life and then do something with it. Maybe they're going to investigate, ask questions, do an activity, talk to one another, do a web quest. We want them to interact with the content. And then we come back with our mini lecture, the content overview, and we start to solidify it and we start to help them see what they've learned and to make those cognitive schemas and those maps. So then they can analyze it and think about how does this impact that information as it relates to my life. Now, the good news in all of this, as we're thinking about how do we engage students and create these interactive lectures, is when researchers ask students, you know, what is most helpful? What would be a really good engaging way to learn? What students said was, well, everything. Yeah, discussion is fine. Working through problems, great. Study guides, good. Textbook, good. All of it. The key was not which tool. So I don't want you to leave this presentation thinking like, oh gosh, now I have to have all this new little bag of tricks. What you need to have is tapping into their why and then building the experience so they can explore and they can reflect and they can start to see how that's going to help them. So that might be creating some sort of a web quest or a game, a simulation, a classroom assessment technique. Now, this is the point in the presentation where people often will be like, yeah, that sounds great in theory, but I literally have no idea what I would do or how I would bring that in. And here is where now as faculty, 
we can really tap into the power of generative AI. I use generative AI all day, every day, to help me come up with those activities. So for example, I'm gonna do a stop share here and I'm gonna go over to the generative AI program. You start to think about how would this be important to students? What would students need in your class? And you might come over to generative AI and say, I need a debate topic that students can start with to explore their understanding of whatever. I'm going to say here, um, compliance, something I cover in social psychology. And then I'll just tell it, this is a social psychology course. We can start pretty basic. And it's gonna say, okay, here's some potential topics. And I can now utilize the topic it gave me, or I can say, give me more options. And I can work with ChatGPT to help me develop those activities that I'm gonna use in class. I could ask it to create a web quest for me. I could ask it for a scenario, a case study. I can ask it for a game, a problem solving dialogue. Here, let's pretend as I'm looking at theirs, I'm like, okay, I like the idea of censorship in media. So I'm gonna pick number four randomly. And I would just tell ChatGPT, I like number four, create a short scenario slash case study that I can give students to launch the topic. Make it something that, I didn't even spell something right, we're gonna pretend I did, that college students can relate to. And so now it's going to be like, sure, okay. It's now gonna give me a little case study. I could bring that case study to class and I could use it to be the beginning of our conversation about compliance. And I could now ask it, ChatGBT, okay, so give me an activity students can do to explore this case study. And it's going to keep going. I'll let it finish. Otherwise, it gets angry if we stop it right in the middle and tell it we're done. But you can now ask them, oops, let me generate it there ask for an activity. Now let's even say I'm like, oh, wait, that's way too much. I'll be like, um, needs to be shorter, needs to be something we can do in 15 minutes. With a class of 50. You can use ChatGPT to come up with, or, or Bing or Bard or Claude, it doesn't matter what generative AI you're using, to help come up with the kinds of things that you can do to make the class truly interactive. I went through my entire general psychology course that I teach, and I reframed every single lecture why you should know this information. And then I went through for every one of them, and I said, let's find an activity or a problem or a case study or a dilemma or a problem-solving task that we start to kick off the class with. And because ChatGPT is so efficient, I was able to do that within a reasonable workload. And so now every single class that students are coming to, we're starting by doing something. And then from that activity, we're training them that passive learning is not how this class is going to go. The result of that has been, first of all, attendance is up. Even though I do not take attendance and attendance is not mandatory, students are more willing to come to class because they see the value add of coming to class. So that's step one. Step two, not only am I having them do things and engage, but because they're engaging, talking, collaborating, it's starting to become a social experience. So they're not only coming to class to learn the content, but they're coming to class because they are part of a social community. And that social community then starts to engage them back into the classroom. And then the last part of it is at the end of every class, I'm talking to students very explicitly about how that information is going to help them personally or professionally in what they're doing. And so some of it, especially in my general studies courses, is really just talking to them about how they can understand themselves better, how they can relate to people around them better. And then I'll talk to them about the skills that they're gaining. So as we're doing activities, I'll tell the students, 
okay, in this activity, I'm going to have you do a web quest, but when you do a web quest, it's really tapping into your critical thinking, information literacy, here's the outcomes that we're gonna do, and here's how you could take that outcome and put it in your personal portfolio to showcase these skill sets. So now, even if they're not completely into that topic, they are into how do I develop skills and how do I show those skills to keep that portfolio that I can give to future employers? Really getting the Gen Z student to be engaged is less about the tips and the tricks and the techniques, and it's more about recognizing they're practical, they're goal-oriented, and they have a really short attention span. So when you can start to break it up and do the activities with the discussion, with the content, students are going to stay with you. You just are repeatedly resetting their attention. And the more that you have them actively engaging in the problem solving strategy, the more they're now going to rely on themselves to start finding and soliciting that information and asking the questions to make it a meaningful learning experience. We know that students today do not tend to read, despite the fact that it's very effective. So what I would encourage you to do is think about how else could I give them flexible access to that information? Are there videos that will convey the information? Are there videos that will tap into their curiosity that will get them motivated enough to go back and read the information? The more we can give them flexible access to information, the more likely they're going to be to really utilize that information. In addition to that, when we start flipping our classroom and having them engage first and tap into the curiosity first, now when they go use that information, whether it's a video or readings or a website, whatever it is we're using to give them content, they now have something to attach it to. And as we're creating those interactive experiences, we're really maximizing the value of that contact time that they're getting. Rather than them listening passively to a lecture that they could listen to via video, they're seeing the value of coming in and talking and doing and interacting. I mean, think about your own experiences now. As Stacy and I were talking about prior to this webinar starting, a lot of faculty don't attend the live version because they can gain the same information from listening to the video later. If your students can gain the same information from listening to your lecture later, let them listen to your lecture later because they can't gain the opportunity of interacting, problem solving, talking, exchanging later. That they want to do with their classmates just in time. So the more that you can really build in that regular interactivity, the more you're going to get students really starting to learn and engage because they're motivated to. Not motivated to the grade, but actually motivated to learn. So some of the interactive things, there's nine up here on the screen that I found particularly helpful when working with Gen Z students. First of all, they love exploring things that do not have a clear answer. So give them case studies that are muddy, that are debatable, that there's lots of possibilities. Now with generative AI, I will often have them in class, sit down at computers with a buddy or a partner working in small groups, and I'll say, I want you to go into generative AI, and I want you to actually start putting what ifs. What if we did this? What might happen? What are the potential consequences if we took this action based on this case study? Or how might it have changed if these conditions were different? Same with a current event analysis having students deal with things that are happening in their life right now. So bringing in news articles, bringing in TikToks, things that are happening around them. One of the things my students love to do, and this works really well in my human development, my general studies class, is I will start with a TikTok and I will show them a TikTok and I'll say, okay, let's analyze it here. What's going on? We're gonna give it a social psychology analysis. Why would they even record it? What motivated them to record it? What's influencing things? What's influencing the viewing rates? And we start to analyze things that are in the world that they live in. Likewise, they really like analyzing their own content. And so having students generate, bring in the current events, bring in the TikToks that they wanna analyze. I tell my students all the time, 
I want you to be an effective consumer of psychological information. Whether you are a psychology major or not, you are surrounded in a world that is explained by psychological principles. When you notice something that's weird or funny or awkward or unusual, bring it in. Let's talk about it. Let's analyze it. And the more that students bring that in, the more they'll start to report that they see psychology in the world around them and they start to get motivated. And the more they're motivated, the more they're engaged. Um, they also like thought problems. When I tell students right up front, there is not a correct answer. There are multiple correct paths that will all have consequences. So let's explore them. Generative AI is phenomenal at creating thought problems. And you can just go into it and say, I need a thought problem that will let students explore various options related to the following topic. The other thing that's really helpful when you're having them work in these collaborative environments is to assign them into relatively consistent. I like to use trios. So if people aren't there, we still have at least a group to work with. But let them actually start to know the people they're working with. Rather than just saying, get with somebody near you or find a partner, assign small learning groups at the beginning of the semester and tell students, you know, this group of three or this group of five, these are your go-to people. And when I do an activity, I'm gonna have you find each other and I want you to talk and get to know each other. Asking students to engage in ways that they do not have to have a fear of getting things wrong. So brainstorming, um, thinking about possibilities, doing anything where it's opinion-based that then you can layer in the theory and the content. All of these things really start to get students to think about their why. They are purpose-driven. Gen Z students want to know, why do I need to learn this? If you're asking them to memorize information for a test, they want to know, why do I have to memorize it? Now, I'm not encouraging you to not necessarily have them do tests or not having them memorize, but you should be able to answer that question, why? And it should be more than because it's part of your grade. It might be that they need to memorize it because they need a working knowledge of the vocabulary. But if you can't come up with a why, maybe you need to think about what is a more authentic assessment that students would be motivated to engage with. And they would want to actually dive in and learn the content because they care about that content. In some cases, it's not even necessarily the content itself. It's the process of learning and the product of how they learn that. Um, I'll give you another example. We did a research study on this one several years ago, but one of our objectives was really just to have students reflect. We wanted them to think about its application in their own life. This was a human development class, so it was all about how these theories of development could explain what they were going through, how they relate to other people, how they form relationships. So it was very personal driven. And because we were really focusing on reflection, the assignment was to journal about it, just journal and write about it. And what we found was the journals were bad. I, they didn't care. Students didn't like doing the journaling. It wasn't meaningful to them. And so I told students, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what skill you need to develop for your future career. It might be oral communication and being able to talk effectively in front of others. It might be being able to visually depict information like in an infographic. It might be fluid writing or writing for a particular audience. I actually don't care how you demonstrate your knowledge. What I care about is that you reflect on this content and you apply it to your own life. I want you to pick a way that you demonstrate that knowledge that will have a meaningful outcome for you to put in your portfolio to show future employers or graduate school that you have that skill. When I changed that assignment and I give, gave students the agency to pick their own way to demonstrate the reflections, the reflections became deeper, they became more meaningful, they became longer, and students started to report that the process of reflecting was a much more valuable task for them simply because they not only had the agency to pick how to demonstrate it, but because we highlighted the purpose in creating that assessment for their own future. Students are naturally more invested in publicly disseminated outcomes. So maybe if it's instead of writing a journal that they're gonna to submit to you in the learning management system, 
you give them an option of creating a blog or you let them do something that could be given to the real world and shared with people. I just recently told students rather than writing a paper to show me that they understood this one concept, we were looking on compliance, conformity and obedience. I wanted them to create a TikTok video. Now, they didn't have to post it to TikTok. That was their choice whether they shared it. But I wanted them to think about how people that watch TikTok would perceive that information and how it would be relevant to them. And I wanted them to teach and communicate the information in a manner amenable to TikTok. The quality of those projects were through the roof. Not only was it publicly disseminated, but they saw the value add. So you really want to think about how you can reframe the learning experience for Gen Z students that they really see that practical value add for their own career, their own future or their own life at this point. The more they become invested in needing that information, the more they're going to come to class and they're going to participate. Part of changing this experience too is to really break down that barrier between we're in class or we're not in class. When we start to think about class as our time to collaborate and to engage and to interact and to practice things and to demonstrate things, we can now start moving some of the things that we used to do in class out of class. And so if you have lectures and you want to lecture, perhaps consider putting those online because students really are willing to watch those lectures later, to engage with the content in a variety of ways. Students constantly are in contact with their phone. Research shows they're reaching for it on average a little less than every seven minutes. They can multitask across a number of different devices. They are built to pick and pull information as they need it. So let's tap into that. Let's give them the information so that they can access it from their phone while they're sitting in line at the coffee shop, that they can watch a video later. When we ask students about their technology preferences, they tell us it doesn't really matter. They're fine with all of the technology. And I think the good news for us as faculty is that means we have a lot of flexibility. If you're not an online video person, don't worry about it. They're fine with websites. If you're not a smart board person, don't worry about it. You can give them a video or a digital textbook. They're just really comfortable with technology. And when we say, you know, how much do these help you when you're learning? They say, well, it's all helpful. I think this frees us up. You don't have to become super tech savvy. You don't have to know all of these different strategies. You just have to be willing to think about how will my students access the content they need in the worlds that they live. So really embrace the digital portal, utilize your LMS, have it be where they ask questions and they share information and you share videos and you have dialogue. Think about all the different ways that you can get them the information that they might need and bring them into that experience where they're also sharing that information, finding content, evaluating that content, and then bringing in not only the content that they find, but sharing why they think it's helpful, why it is valuable for their learning. One of the favorite assignments that I do, and it's a favorite of both mine and my students, is I tell them, any given module, I want you to do what I call the video exploration. Pick a topic from this week that you found particularly interesting for you. I don't care what the topic is. What I care about is you're finding pieces of content that you can relate to. And I want you to go learn more. Learn more about it than the textbook told you. Go think about whether the websites that you're finding are valid and real. Look to see what can you find and then come back simply turn on your webcam and talk to me about it. You have three minutes to tell me why you've picked that topic, why it's interesting to you, and what you found. The Gen Z student really does see learning as this interactive, multifaceted experience that extends both in and out of the classroom. They are just likely to see the coffee shop as a place to learn as they are the university. And so we really need to kind of rethink what that means for us. They aren't interested in email. They have to remind themselves to check the email. So think about how can you tap into things like generative AI to get them feedback faster? How can you utilize push technology, such as Remind 101 or texting, to really 
get messages out to students and to connect with them where they're at. We know that students don't tend to come into our office hours and sit in our office, but they are willing to ask questions online and to hop into a Zoom. So start thinking about how you can build those collaborative networks and those digital opportunities to interact and collaborate about your content. When we ask them how they want to learn, they tell us, let us engage with it. Let us talk about it. Let us utilize the resources that are available. Gen Z is incredibly frustrated when we say things like, put your phone away. They see their phone as a tool. It's a tool to collaborate. It's a tool to find information, to log notes, to make reminders, to look things up. They want us to bring it in as part of the learning experience and to give them opportunities to individualize the education for themselves. Now, because there's one of us and a lot of them in a given class, we can't always tailor the education for them, but we can create experiences that allow them to tailor it for themselves. Generative AI gives a lot of possibilities for us to create activities and experiences where students can dive in and give it their own direction, goals, feedback, and see how the content relates to that. Our role in the Zen Gen Z classroom is shifting. Not only do they not want a sage on the stage, they don't want a guide on the side either. They want us to be part of a shared experience, a meddler in the middle, if you will. The meddler in the middle is right there with them, a team member answering questions, posing problems, demonstrating things, creating tasks. And then as they're doing the tasks, being right there saying, did you think about this? What about this? Wait a minute, here's something I didn't think of before. Let's investigate this. We want them to really be part of this dynamic. It's about creating an experience where grading is not simply how did you perform on these three tests and the two term papers. We're looking at the process, the engagement, lots of formative activities where students get feedback and they get guidance. And we're creating something where students can see that personal value. They want to interact. They want to experience it. They want to talk about it. And they want to know why they're learning what they're learning and how this is going to impact their future. So when we talk about our Gen Z students today, you're absolutely right. We do need to rethink how we're teaching to keep their attention. We need to rethink what we're doing for assignments to have true, authentic engagement so that they're motivated because they care about the topic, not simply because they care about the grade. And we need to create a classroom activity where when they come to class, they believe there's value in that because they're talking and touching and doing and engaging. And that taps right into what Brianna mentioned when she said, you know, students seem lonely and they seem disconnected. They are, and we can use our classroom to start bridging that gap. I'll share one final story from my personal experience. I actually have four children. They are all Gen Zers. Two of them are in college, two of them are in high school. And my oldest daughter, when she headed to college a couple years ago, she's just a junior now, she is an introverted, shy, I'm going to kind of say disconnected, somewhat lonely kind of a kid. That's just how she naturally was programmed in life. And she spent the first four weeks of college really isolated. She was struggling to make connections. When I would tell her, you know, make eye contact, talk to people on campus. And she'd say, mom, you don't understand students today. They're not looking at, to make eye contact. They have headphones in. They're looking at their phones. People are talking on their phone. Nobody is interacting. And then one day in her math class, the professor said, okay, today we're going to do an activity. And I'm going to start by having you say, if you feel like you're good at math, I'd like you to raise your hand. And Savannah said, Savannah's my daughter, she said about a third of the class raised their hand. And Savannah was one of them that raised her hand and said, yeah, I feel like I'm pretty good at math. And he said, okay, there are 75 of us in this class. And he goes, there's one of me. Look around the room. There's about 25 people that think they're pretty good at math. For the rest of you that don't have your hand up, I want you to get up right now 
And I want you to go and I want you to find one of those people. And I want you to sit down with them. And for the next 30 minutes, I just want you to tell each other about yourselves, introduce yourself, tell about your hometown, what your interests are, what your experience is with math. And at the end of that, I would like you to exchange contact information of some sort, because this is now going to be your study buddy. When you don't feel comfortable coming to me, when you don't have time to come to me, when it's 10 p.m. and it's not appropriate to come to me, you're now going to have three or four study buddies, somebody you can connect to. The activity was intentionally about connecting students as collaborators. And now, three years later, that girl, my student, my daughter met in math class, is her roommate, it's her best friend. Part of the experience we are creating for students today is not just about our content. It's about engaging in our campus communities. It's about getting to know the other people in our campus communities. And when we can do that around our content, we're going to start to engage our students. So when we approach them recognizing they are lonely, they are isolated, they are tech driven, rather than fighting that, let's embrace that. And let's start thinking holistically about our students and what it means to learn and what it means to be a Gen Z student today. And if I'm going to give you my last parting, like, if you only took one thing from this, take that you have to tap into their why. Once you get them intrinsically motivated to learn your content, the activities, the discussion, and the engagement, they're going to follow. But if students can't see why they're learning what they're learning, it really doesn't matter what activity you do. They're not going to be engaged. And that's just the hard reality. Until they are motivated and see the value, they are not going to be able to really benefit from these learning experiences. Um, Ramona asks, is there a follow-up on this webinar for online environments? Um, not from me specifically, but what I will say is a lot of the principles still apply. It's differences in how we get them there. So even in my online classrooms, and I teach primarily online, I do about a quarter of my stuff face-to-face -face here locally at the University of Nebraska, and I do the bulk of my work remotely for Grand Canyon University, but the principles stay the same. Um, trying to tap into their why. Now I'm going to do it asynchronously with a discussion board. I'm going to have them collaborate perhaps asynchronously in small Zoom groups. When we do web quests, they might do that web quest independently and come and report back. So how they do that changes. But really, the why behind it doesn't. We still have to tap into making it personally relevant. We still have to figure out how to make it collaborative. We still have to give them authentic reasons to learn this content. So the big principles remain the same, but the how we get there will change when you're in an online classroom. Actually, you'll laugh. I find it easier to do it asynchronously online. Face-to-face, um, -face, it's just a slightly different experience because you're crunched for time. You only get 50 minutes or 75 minutes. And so I always struggle with how do I fit what I need to in that 50 or 75 minutes. Online asynchronously, we can really think about every student gets the time they need to engage in this in a meaningful way. And so it makes it a lot more flexible, opens that up. Yeah, and Stacy shared that yeah, the go-to knowledge has a ton of different things on this. I actually think I might have one on there that's specifically about active learning for online students. And there might even be one on, I think there's one on engagement strategies for Gen Z students that goes a little bit deeper into online strategies. I'm not completely sure on that, but go in there and do a search because I know we've done a couple of those that are available on GoToKnowledge. Yeah, and Brianna just shared, you know, sometimes we even have to think about when are we motivated and when are we not motivated? Um, because we often are not motivated when it's just a lecture. And that doesn't mean we don't want the content, but it means we're, we became passive. So even myself, if somebody said, do you want to go to this lecture online? Let's even say online so I can be in my pajamas at home. And do you want to watch the live lecture or do you want to watch a recording later? I will almost always choose the recording later because it fits into my schedule. And if I'm going to be passive, it didn't matter to me. So when you think about that for your own lectures, if it's just going to be passive, they absolutely realize they can get it later. And so we are creating a situation in which by the nature of what we do, we are reducing their engagement. And so if you can start to think about the lecture is the least important thing I'm going to do with my time with them, how do I get them doing stuff, talking, thinking, interacting, engaging, and then we build backwards too. 
how do I get them the content they need to then do that successfully?